Hello, I'm Pastor Hilly. Thank you for joining us for Faith Lutheran Church's Adult Forum series. We're calling this episode, The Church's Next Steps. But before we get to our special guest this week, a brief reminder that during this time of social distancing, there is wonderful ministry coming out of the community that we call Faith Lutheran Church in Whitehall, Ohio. Ministry that includes this very podcast. If you would like to support the Ministry of Faith financially, please find the link labeled Giving in the description below. And now, on to our episode. Joining me this week is Hunter Seip, pastor at Good Shepherd Bible Church in Black Lake, Ohio. Hunter, great to see you, man. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being part of this. Hey, Dan. Thanks, thanks so much for having me. People at Faith, thank, thank you for having me on the episode. Yeah, um, so... You know, you, you and I reconnected a couple of days ago, and we talked briefly, but how is this uh, socially distant world treating you and your family, and just how, how's life treating you these days since March? Yeah, uh, it's it's been a wild ride, and I would like to say that, you know, where we're at now is much better than, than where we were. You probably feel the same way. And when all, when all the COVID uh, restrictions hit, my, my family uh, was at an interesting point. We had just had... Uh, a new daughter. So she was two months old. And then we have a three-year-old. We had, we had a three-year-old at the time and then a six-year-old. So we were trying to educate one kid, entertain another kid, and then simply keep the other one alive. Yeah. And so my wife and I, it was just an interesting time for us. Uh, now that school started back up, it's alleviated a lot of things, especially for, for my wife at home. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's still, it's still very, very challenging with, with three small kids and uh, a baby that was born in COVID. She lets no one else hold her. So oh, interesting wow. things that, that happened in the pandemic, but ultimately other than that, uh, we really can't complain. God's been very good to us. Nice. Is the, um, I mean, you have a three-year-old and a six-year-old, so they're in different kind of daycare programs or schools. How, how's that working? Is that, are, are they doing the at-home model? Are they doing the in-person, the hybrid model? Yeah, so um, they are, they're actually at the, at the same school. One's in kindergarten now, so one's in K-4, uh, and then the other's in first grade, and they're both in person. So it's, oh, a, it's a blessing and a curse at the same time because it's a different – they are in person, so the precautions are, are a lot more uh, and a lot more stringent. So every day, you know, the mask, the sanitizing, the hand washing, uh, all that goes into that. Um, it is a, it's a little bit more intense. But uh, I've been surprised at the adaptability of our kids. They've, you know, it kind of doesn't bother them as much as it would bother me. Yeah. So they're, they're rolling with the punches pretty, pretty well. But yeah, they're, they're uh, in school uh, five days a week um, all, and all day. So wow. pretty crazy. Yeah. It's a good relief for my wife, though, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I bet so. I, uh, I, my nephew is seven. And uh, I was talking to my brother the other day and he goes, I love my kid to death. Don't really like him that much recently. I love him though. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, that sentiment is is well felt. Uh, I mean, it, it gave us a new and and profound sense of thankfulness for school teachers. You know, when we were trying to edu- literally educate, you know, home homeschool during the pandemic, we were not expecting to homeschool our kids, but essentially that's what we were doing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it just gave us a lot of um, just high esteem for the amount of energy. Uh, the amount of thoughtfulness that it takes for these teachers day in and day out. It's a, it's a beast, man. It's a beast. Yeah. I, yeah. I, and I, I have friends who are teachers. I'm sure that, uh, you have some as well. And the last couple of months has just been it, every conversation I have with them. I'm like, I want to ask you how you're doing, but I don't want to like be the, uh, the, the last feather that, you know, sets off the emotional avalanche that's going to come from that chaotic world. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, and, and I, I've talked to some who are still teaching online and mm-hmm. some who are teaching in the classroom, and I really don't think anyone's happy. No. Uh, I don't think anyone's really content with, with where they're at. And there's something to be said about, you know, finding, finding hope and joy in, in all moments. Yep. Uh, but it is really, it is really challenging for, for teachers at this time. Yeah, with that out. So, Hunter, you and I are both pastors here in the greater Columbus area, though our congregations, our worship styles, our text are really, really different. Um, so let's kind of uh, start this part off by uh, telling me a little bit about a Good Shepherd Bible uh, Church in Blacklick. Like uh, it, it's a mission start or it's a church plant. That's the phrase, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and you might in some sense 
call us both. Um, so we, we are a church plant. Uh, we are planted out of two sister churches. One's in the area, uh, Calvary Bible Church in Clintonville. Mm-hmm. And then one's actually uh, in, in South Carolina, uh, where I'm originally from in, in many ways, uh, East North Church in, in Greenville, South Carolina. And we're uh, really a mixed bag. We would call ourselves non-denominational, but we would, we would pigeonhole ourselves within a couple denominational circles that may be helpful for clarity. Uh, one would be Southern Baptist. Uh, so we, we have some good friends uh, there, in the, there in the Southern Baptist circles that we've connected with. Uh, you may be more broadly familiar with a church planting network called Acts 29. Uh, if you know a man by the name of Matt Chandler, it's a little bit more broadly evangelical. Uh, we we kind of fall into that camp as well. Um, and even our tradition uh, is is kind of rooted in actually independent fundamental Baptist circles. Okay. Uh, we wouldn't necessarily claim that, but that's our history. If you look back at our history, that's certainly where we're from. Uh, but there's a, there's kind of a, we, we might call ourselves recovering fundamentalists, if you, if you, if you will. Um, but yeah, but, but really our, our heart is rooted in, and just helping all people believe, grow and hope in Jesus. And that's, that's really our mission. It's a discipleship, a discipleship focused church. Uh, so we're just, we want all people to, to believe, grow and hope in Jesus. And we believe the best way for that to happen is through the proclamation of the gospel. Mm-hmm. So, it, and actually if, you know, one of the reasons we connected, uh, I, I'm, I would consider myself even a closet Lutheran. Uh, I've done a lot of Lutheran studies uh, in seminary. Uh, some of my favorite classes were either on Luther or Luther's theology. Yeah. So I, I really resonate with a lot of Lutheran thought. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily consider myself um, as sacramental as you probably would, would all want me to be. But in the same sense, uh, the Baptists probably aren't too, too happy with my own version of, of, of sacramentology. Uh, you know, they, they would probably look at me and say like, aren't you, aren't you Lutheran? And I would probably say like, well, not quite, but, um, but I might be closer than, than you might be comfortable with, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, the law gospel distinction, proclamation of the gospel, uh, and that kind of taking a specific shape, uh, an increased thought on sacramentology, like all of those things, uh, speak, speak heavily to me. So even our name, Good Shepherd Bible Church probably reeks a little bit of, of Lutheranism and that's, that's probably right. I mean, Good Good Shepherd is one of those uh, standard rotation Lutheran church names, right? You got St. Matthew, you got Good Shepherd, you have All Saints. Like, they're just faith, uh, uh, really standard Lutheran church names. So when you – actually, the, the church I grew up in in North Carolina was Good Shepherd Lutheran. So as soon as you said that, I was like, it's been a minute since I've typed out Good Shepherd Lutheran. Yeah, and actually in South Carolina um, – I, I, my there's a lot of reasons why why we kind of went with the name good shepherd bible church uh a lot of it's related to just my own um uh, understanding of of the lord came a lot from psalm 23 uh so so seeing him as as our shepherd in in that context also john 10 um but one of the more personal reasons for me is i i ran into a, a lutheran pastor down in south carolina who pastored a good shepherd lutheran church down there uh, it was an lcms congregation and uh he he really helped me wiggle through um, just a lot of my own approach to scripture and, and battling through Luther's thoughts uh, and coming, coming to peace with some of it. So there, there's some personal significance in there as nice. well. Nice. Um, so you guys being a church plant up in the Blacklick area, which is that kind of like Blacklick, kind of Blacklick, kind of what upper Arlington, somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah, Black League is an interesting area, and it's actually one of the reasons we, we chose it for its its kind of its interestingness. So Black League is is really a collection of neighborhoods. There's no real city centers. So you're not going to drive by and and see signs that demarcate this is where Black League starts and this is where it ends. Uh, you know, there's no there's no town center of, of gathering for government. There's there's none of that. Um, but really, it's a collection of of neighborhoods, and it's pigeonholed between four uh, major uh, or for other su- suburbs of Columbus. So one of them is Gehanna. So if you go a little bit further to the east, you're going to run into Blacklick. Uh, or Reynoldsburg. So if you think of Broad Street, which uh, those of you in Whitehall would know Broad Street. But outside of 270, if you go north, you're going you're gonna to hit uh, a lot of Blacklick, the Blacklick area. If you go south, you're going to hit Reynoldsburg. So there's Gehanna, there's Reynoldsburg. Further out east is Petascala. Mm-hmm. And then further north is going to be New Albany. So those four like quadrants, uh, right in the middle of that form, form Blacklick. 
And what we're seeing happen, and one of the reasons we, we targeted Blacklick, is those areas are experiencing some unique growth. Yeah. And they're kind of running into each other. And they're running into each other at, in, in Blacklick. Mm. And kind of the four different cultures that, are, that make up those areas, you have you know, New Albany, very, very white, predominantly um, high-class folks, white-collar. Uh, Gahanna is a fairly mixed bag of, um, of, of middle-class folks. There's a, there's a decent representation, but it's still, it's still a lot of what Ohio is, which is predominantly a white feeling towards it, middle-class white. Reynoldsburg is going to be a little bit uh, low to, to middle class, uh, but very diverse. Uh, and we love that diversity. And then Pataskala is going to remain kind of the constant Ohio, Ohio town. Yeah. Um, but all of these areas are converging into one another. And what we're realizing is that these cultures are, are colliding. And we, we thought, man, what a, what a great way to, to proclaim the gospel to these different cultures by, by hitting this, this central hub of Blacklick. So Blacklick has become uh, one of the more melting pot areas of, of Columbus and really even Ohio itself. It's actually a very diverse area for Ohio. Wow. And so uh, prior, prior to the shutdown, uh, and where were you meeting? Like, where is your physical space? And uh, like, are, are you subletting or renting or what, what's going on? Yeah, good question. We, uh, we, before the shutdown, we were really just having um, upstart meetings, which is very uh, informational. P- people were wondering, what is the church plant? Why would we do this? Uh, what's, the, what's the theology of church planting? Um, some of them are wondering, like, what will your church just look like? So we were having those kind of meetings, and we were meeting in, uh, uh, in Westerville. There's a connection that we have to Northside Christian School, and uh, we, we were using their space to just hold informal meetings, um, and, and they, they were giving it, I mean, they were just letting us use their space, which is very generous. When you get a free space in church planning, you, you take it. Yeah. Uh, so, so we were meeting there. God has since opened up a door uh, for us to meet closer to our target area. It's a New Albany Evangelical Free Church. Okay. Uh, they're allowing us to use their space. It's right underneath 161 out east. Uh, so it's, again, it's labeled New Albany, but if you look on a map, you might consider it Blacklick. Okay. Uh, but if you get mail from the church, it'll be zoned Pataskala. So it's right, it's right in that area. It's kind of a, it's kind of a weird pocket, but we're meeting there on Sunday nights uh, at 545. Uh, we're holding, we're holding services. Um, we are preparing for a launch coming up October 25th. Nice. And basically what that, what that is, um, we're, we're holding services and our, our people are definitely, um, you know, enjoying the spiritual benefits of having actual services on Sunday. Uh, but it is, in one sense, ramping up for for the launch, where we're opening up our doors to the con- uh, to the community, and saying we'd love to be able to see if we can we can help meet your needs, uh, and certainly get get you the gospel so that you can believe, grow, and hope in Jesus. That's that's what we would love to to be able to do with you. Um, so that's that's kind of where we're at and, and what we're doing. What um what's that address for that location? Oh gosh, fourteen nine nine nine. Oh, Worthington Road. You know what? Can I Google it? Yeah, yeah or, or just send it to me later, and I can put the uh, time, date, and address for the uh, launch in the description. Sure, yeah, that would be great. More than happy. So, um, I, I definitely want to talk about you guys uh, resuming uh, worship in person because I think that's very interesting. And again, like we're in really similar spots. Um, but so, what was that? What was your March transition? I, I'm thinking about March on my end, right? Uh, I, I established congregation, 140 years, physical building. March comes around, everything gets shut down. And over the course of seven days, I, my line is I became a YouTube content creator. Yeah, that's right. That's what we, that's what we can do. Like that's, you know, that's the right. tools we have. But so you guys are doing these kind of like home meetings, these planner meetings. So there's, there's not that physical location with, with that 150 years of, uh, 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 you know, this is where we go kind of uh, mentality to it. So what was, what was March and April and May looking like for you? Did, did I know how crazy I felt. And I guess my question is like, did you feel even crazier than I did? Cause you're like ethereally grasping at straws. No, I, I, I man, I really feel, especially 
to be honest, I felt like the established congregations had it way worse than, than we did because mm. we don't have a precedent. You know, we, we didn't have, uh, we didn't have the rhythms of, uh, you know, the traditional rhythms week in and week out for, for generations really. Yep. Um, we didn't, we didn't have that. We had a couple weeks where we were, we were up and going and then things shut down. So we, we went to zoom, like I think 99% of uh, all people did went to zoom and uh, you know, it just felt odd. It just felt weird. It, it was, it slowed us down in the sense of we, we couldn't get as much accomplished. We couldn't get a sense of the room. Uh, so it was challenging from a spiritual standpoint uh, to feel like we were really connecting with yeah. folks. Um, but the one thing that, that, that did make it nice is that, you know, we were a small congregation and we were a young congregation. Um, I know even the, the, the church that we're coming from Calvary Bible church, you know, they, they have about 250, 300 people, uh, and it's a mixed bag of, of ages. And so you get the whole experience of, you know, we're not comfortable quite yet meeting, uh, or we're very comfortable meeting. Uh, you, you, you have a hard time with the idea of flexibility. Whereas in our congregation, you know, we were working with at that point around 25 people. Mm -hmm. and they were all relatively young and so you know i had the opportunity to actually call each one of our uh of our members and just say like you know hey where are you at how do you feel uh about meeting getting together physically when you know of course when when uh, things were opening up yeah and uh and they were all like yes please like we'd, we'd love that and we didn't get we didn't get kickback um at all but i think a lot of that just stems from we're young we're flexible and we're small I think you add in uh, age dynamics, if you add in certainly more people uh, and, and add just more diversity to that, you're going to get a lot more, uh, uh, probably a lot more kickback and it's probably going to be smart and wise, yeah. um, but it's just going to be, you know, it's just going to be a different, different dynamic. So we really, in one sense, have it, had it a lot easier uh, than a lot of established congregations. I know uh, the pastor at Calvary Bible Church was, was pulling his hair out because, you know, he was kind of getting it from all sides. And uh, the, the idea is if you're probably just sticking to the middle of the road, you're probably doing the right thing. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's really, it was really challenging for, for a lot of established churches. We, we, I mean, we had our own challenges. It was challenging right. to connect, but uh, I, I can, I can safely say um, we, we did have it easier. Yeah. I mean, and for, for, I think you're right on, on a number of reasons, right? Because when you start um, increasing your average age, then you may start increasing, you know, health risks. And, and yeah, like getting together 40, 80 year olds is a really different thing than getting together 40, like 20 to 30 year olds. Just in terms of like, are they ready? Are they reticent? Are they somewhere in the middle? And what, I, what I've been saying to people since March is um, as things start to roll back or open up, People feeling individually comfortable is a is a personal decision that comes from that person crossing that bridge. That's right. And no matter what side of the bridge we're on, we have to not demonize the other person. That is <laughs> Which is what I say in a lot of conversations these days as well. I'm like, it doesn't matter what side of the bridge you're on. Just don't demonize one another and we'll all get there eventually, you know? That's right. Um, yeah, I think there's, there's I, don't, I mean, you could point to several things that help to polarize uh, our communities and our thoughts and our politics and our, and our religion. And we, we really have to be very, very careful um, that these, these issues, which seem, seem at moments, primary issues, yeah. you know, they, they seem at moments to be the issue to discuss and to divide over. Um, we, we really have to be thoughtful and careful and do our best to take the emotion out of it because the, the, the risk is that we're actually dehumanizing people. We're taking the, you know, functionally speaking, taking the image of God right out of our brothers and sisters, uh, or maybe even removing that brother and sister label altogether uh, on issues that are, are, are not meant to be that divisive. And so you can, you know, 100% have your opinion, uh, have, have how you're going to lead your family, how you're going to lead yourself. Uh, 100%, but the, the amount of graciousness and care and thought and concern um, and love that we are to have for one another should reflect uh, even the, the incarnational aspect of Jesus where we're coming closer to each other, not moving away. No, I, hands down. I, I was talking to a friend of mine uh, last week. Uh, it was after the uh, presidential debate, and, and we're, we're not, we don't need to talk politics or anything. That's not really my vibe. But my, uh, the, the point of that conversation was um, 
if you have a two-party system up in a zero-sum game, it can become really combative because it's a zero-sum game and one wins and one loses. Hmm. Uh, which, again, kind of puts us in this position that we look across the aisle and we steal the humanity from one another. Yes. And I think that, you know, as Christians, Jesus calls us not to be on path A or B, but to follow Christ, to, to use Mark's words, on the way, which is interacting with all people with humility and grace and compassion and that ability to, uh, you know, follow the golden rule, r- regardless of what denomination we're in, regardless of which way we're registered to vote or what state we're from. All of those things are secondary to the call on our lives as Christians. And, and I, I think that even talking about as we're opening things up and cause I, I sat in in a couple kind of heated conversations uh, in the communities in Linden, uh, Linden here about when are we opening and when are we not? And again, yeah, I, I have this almost visceral knee jerk reaction whenever an argument becomes really combative and we stop seeing one another with, with that grace and humility. That's right. You know? Yeah. We, if we really believe that God, that God is sovereign over our lives and that his, his love and his gospel is being shaped into our lives. So like think Romans, you know, Romans eight twenty eight. for those of us who, who love God and are called according to his purpose, all things are working together for good. If, if we really believe that that's true, um, or as, you know, as Luke says in, in Acts, uh, well, actually it's, he's quoting Jesus. Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority. Um, you know, I, I think then, then we submit to that sovereignty to say, God's working out something in everybody's life. Right. And so these people that have opinions, you know, they're coming from somewhere. They're being shaped by something. And so asking questions uh, about where is this coming from? Why, why do you think that? You know, what do you think is at stake? What do you think is most important by your, you know, from your opinion? Um, instead of simply accusing or labeling or, you know, um, yeah, assuming is a, a big word there. Instead of doing that, they're actually giving them the sense to to be human, and say, you know, God. And they might not they might not even say God. They might just say, well, I think this because of this experience or you know this primary thought that I have that I think is really important. Um, those are good questions for us to keep that humanity aspect of us alive and well. No, I agree, and it, it reminds me of a of a story I heard, uh, at a conference I was at, and I was talking about this missionary who went up and his, uh, his uh, heart's desire was to bring the gospel to the goth community, uh, the goth community in, in you know, Europe and whatnot. And so he went and like lived amongst them for a while. And, you know, a, a, as you do, like that's good mission work. You, you enculturate yourself into the community and walk with people and that sort of thing. Um, and so he starts telling them about Jesus and inviting them to baptism. Mm. And one of the chiefs from the goth community goes, oh, yeah, yeah, we already do that. And huh. And Harry was a little confused, and he goes, can I come and watch this? And so they invite him, and they have this big baptism, and it's on a lake. And uh, the, the men were coming down and getting baptized. But as they would walk into the lake, they would hold their right arm up out of the water, and they would be totally submerged except for their right arm. And every right. guy who went through the lake got in the lake, held up his arm, got baptized, and came out the other side. And so the missionary asked the chief, well, why do you, why, why do all the men hold their right arm out of the water when they're getting baptized? And the chief said, well, you know, we're a, we're a, a, a war culture and your right arm is your killing arm. And we know in the Ten Commandments, one of them is thou shall not kill. So we baptize everything but the right arm so we can still go to battle. Oh my. This is really great. Like, how many things in our own lives are like, I'm baptized except for my political opinion or except for my sports team or except for my finances or except for, we, we all That's do. That's so right. Oh, man. Yeah, if that, if that doesn't sum up our age, I, you know, I don't, I don't know what does. It, and a lot of these things are, you know, these self-proclaimed identity factors for us, you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. You're, that's so right. Yeah, it's a great version of that. Mm. So you guys are you guys are back. You're doing live events, which is really cool. Um, we are still at Faith. Our live worship events are still suspended. I never use the word canceled because you can't cancel the Church of God. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. suspend the live events. You know, and that way I feel like I'm David Bowie. Right, the show's not canceled. It's just suspended. We'll come back around. Right. Right. That's right. So. 
what do uh, what do your uh, what does live worship look like for you guys? Yeah, um, it, well, it it is a little odd. Um, we're thankful to be uh, to be in a service, to be able to have a service and, and meet together. Uh, but certainly, all the all the social distance protocols you know, are in place. We are in, we are in masks. So that's a little, that's a little tricky. We're singing through masks and that's, that's tricky. Um, even our, uh, our communion, we, we've had communion several times. Um, and, and we, we do, we do communion every week. So it's something we're processing weekly. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we're just taking steps to, to make sure that, that we're being thoughtful. So for some, uh, they're happy with taking kind of a, a more communal approach. So in the sense of using the same cup, uh, we have divvied up bread as well. So, you know, no one's touching other people's food right. uh, in in that way. Uh, but a lot of hand sanitizer uh, before and after, uh, you know, it's just, it's just a little tricky, a couple steps here and there, but really I, I told our team, you know, most people are, are very happy with joining in and participating if you have a plan and they, they want to know that you have a plan. So, you know, let's think through, let's be smart. Um, and let's be consistent. Let's execute a consistent plan. Uh, and most people will be happy. And we do have some, so we have like prepackaged uh, communion as well. So, you know, it's, you know, no one's touching anybody's stuff at all. And it's an individually wrapped. Uh, and we do have some of our folks who, who go that route and it's, it's wonderful. It's fine. Um, but for the most part, you know, most, most people are um, happy to be there, keeping their social distance and, and, and participating that way. Um, yeah, I mean, much, much like a normal, um, again, we, we kind of come out of Baptistic circles, um, but we do, we really do want to be thoughtful and liturgical about our, our worship structure. Uh, so it's not just, let's pick our, you know, our four favorite hymns and, and, you know, we'll, we'll sing those. We really, we really want to think through, and, and this might resonate with, with some Lutheran thought, but we actually build our, our worship service around the law gospel distinction. Um, so allowing us to feel the weight of the law, uh, bringing in scripture reading, uh, bringing in prayers of confession and repentance that, that highlight the, the law and its uh, accusatory role in our lives. Uh, but then really parking the bus on the gospel. And of course, uh, the preaching and the sacraments being, being the highlight, uh, of those, uh, of those moments where we're driving towards exulting in the finished work of Christ for us. Uh, that's those are all things that that we are kind of driving towards in our worship services. So you'll you'll be able to experience uh, both law and gospel uh, intentionally in our service uh, week to week. So we're thankful we're thankful for that, and our people are very. Um, but I, I wouldn't say they're aware in the sense of they know exactly what's going on, but they are learning. Right. Yeah. Uh, the walk through our people, walk with our people, um, even on that very distinction itself. Uh, it's been very helpful for our folks. That's really cool. I, I always find uh, coming from a Lutheran background and coming from a, from a background uh, that I spend a lot of time training in uh, liturgical theology and uh, liturgical history, um, especially when we start looking at what is, what is the, uh, um, the, the intentionality with which we build the worship event. Um, it's such a great, there are so many, I should say, there are so many individual teaching moments in every part of that, yes. you, you know, or even when we look at liturgical hardware, the, the fact that everything we use in church, uh, everything we use in worship has a distinct name and a specific function, right? It, it's not a bowl, it's a font, it's not a table, it's an altar, it's not, uh, it's not a, a bench, it's a pew, it's not a donation, it's an offering. Right, and so with every one of those, there's this really intentional teaching moment of, well, why do we call it that? And, and you know, it kind of lives in that that duality that we uh, live in the world that is as we wait for the world that is to come. Yes, right? okay. we're, we're we're using these physical tools of our own existence to um, shadow play the kingdom that we are waiting to come in. Um, That's right. mm. Yeah, I, uh, I. I, I taught confirmation for years at previous churches, and that was uh, my favorite like two week lesson was taking the kids through the entire uh, through the whole church and pointing out everything, and then uh, giving them you know this is what you would call it, but this is the church name, and then you see these kids like latch on to that, and then you see the the kids correcting their parents, and they're like oh go sit on the bench, you're like no 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 the pew dad the pew. Um, Here's the theological significance behind it. Yeah. yeah. 
did you ever uh, did you uh, did you ever get into uh, the the preaching style of um, mystagogical preaching? Um, no. Myst- Mystagogical no. preaching was, uh, it was St. Ambrose, uh, the Bishop of Milan, 4th century. It was kind of his bread and butter. And the idea of mystagogical preaching is um, instead of preaching off of whatever the gospel reading is, or the epistle or the Old Testament is, um, you use as your primary sermon illustration part of worship itself. So you preach off of the the giving of the offering, or you preach off of the passing of the peace, or you preach off of um, the coming forward to the table. And then in in a very kind of like a a free will Baptist style, you find all the images that support that idea. So that you you sit through a 15, 20 minute sermon about the reality of standing up and walking up the aisle to go to communion. And you've just heard a 20-minute sermon about the Israelites standing up in Egypt and walking through the desert into the promised land. Or, you, you know what I mean? Like all these other things that you pick up or, or the disciples who stand up, walk to the hillside, and then it's the feeding of the 5,000. And that way, yeah, when uh, the assembly gathered is in that moment, they stand up. And it kind of, uh, the, the idea is to give them this multi-sensory experience, then I'm not walking to the front of the room to have communion. I'm walking in tune and in time with all of church history. Yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic. And I, oh man, yeah, we, I think we could, I think two things in, in this way, like for, for those of us who have known the scriptures and have, have walked with Christ for, for many years, you know, that stuff just rings in, the, in our hearts, really it sings in our hearts. It, it resonates with, with what God is, is doing. Um, and even you mentioned the idea of educating our folks. Um, you know, we're, we're hoping to, and this is one of the reasons that God, I think God has allowed church plants to, to go on. It really does reach new people. Mm-hmm. It reaches people who haven't, who haven't heard the gospel or don't know what they're doing. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's interesting for us because we're, we're going in between those lines of, you know, the already and the not yet, you know, and, and, and walking through, you know, reaching people in our community, but also seeking to bring them to a different heavenly community. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, they're, they're walking in and they don't know the names of stuff and they don't have any experience for processing, you know, what even church is like. They're kind of scared to come to church. They have all these expectations and they think it's just a bunch of rules or whatever. And so, you know, we, we walk those lines of like, all right, let's just start with ground, with ground zero. Um, you know, we, we do sing. So, you know, this is, you know, for us, it's like we, we watch a screen. And so it's, it's easier for our people to, to take a look at a screen uh, instead of like pick up a, a hymnal and say like, well, what's this hymnal? And like, you're like, no, 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 that's actually the Psalter. You need this book. This is the, you know, it's all those mechanics, uh, you know, for those, for those folks, they don't, they don't know what to expect. They don't know how to process that. Uh, and so maybe, you know, even for our church, we, we feel like we're on, on ground zero of, of helping people just get educated on the mechanics of, yeah. of church life, you know? Um, and so that's, that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful stage to be at. But I know even with our, with our team, you know, they're, they're working at a little bit of a, of a different level. They've been in church for, for a while uh, and yet they're taking this, this missionary step. And so things are new. And so, you know, they used to sit in pews and now they're sitting in, in chairs that are, are more mobile and can disconnect and can be stacked, uh, you know. And so even some of these, these things that they would feel more comfortable with are being taken away for the sense of being able to be transient, uh, being able to be new. And, and certainly even the, even the stuff that we even own and, and use, it's not even our stuff. It doesn't even have our name on it. Uh, and so they're, they're learning all this and, and really they're kind of, being willing to give up some of the comfortable, the comfortable, comfortable things that they are normally used to worshiping with, uh, for the sake of something new to, to reach people. So it's an interesting stage. Uh, and it's really something I've never really been a part of, you know, I'm, I'm used to being in churches where there's establishment and there's, there's really a lot of meaning tucked in, uh, and we all have our names on things, uh, for many years. And this is a, this is a different stage for us as well. So it's really interesting that you, that you mentioned that, um, and it's something to continue to help educate our people uh, and bring our people along with, even at a, a ground level zero. Oh, absolutely. So as, uh, as two people who have spent a lot of time in the church at various stages in our lives, between you and I, 
when, when we think about the state of the church right now, like the state of the church universal, if you had to pick a, a biblical account or story that you think reflects the state of the church right now, where do you think we are? Oh, man, that, oh, that, is, a, that is a great question. You know, in, 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 this is probably like my fleshliness or just, just my own source of frustration, but my, my, my heart honestly goes immediately to like, uh, like the account of Noah or maybe like God's judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, like Lord, just rain down <laughs> sulfur and brimstone and just nuke us all. You know, I, you know, and again, that's, that's fleshly and certainly uh, that's overplayed. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think, um, I, I really think it takes much more of a, um, an acts, an, an acts one vibe, you know, just in the sense of, you know, Jesus, Jesus has left. Mm-hmm. All right. So we don't, we don't, we don't have the physical Jesus walking around with us bodily here. Right. And we, we certainly have the spirit. So that's not, you know, we're not waiting around for the spirit. We have the spirit, but it's interesting to hear the apostles, you know, they, they saw the resurrected Christ. They know the gospel, right? And we could say, even in our country, we know the gospel in, in a general sense. I mean, historically speaking, the gospels, I mean, it's, it's been around us for a long time, you know, and, and Jesus says, wait for the spirit. I'm going to send you to the ends of the earth and you're going to proclaim the gospel to all, to all people. That's your mission. And the first question out of their mouth is, Lord, when are you going to restore our kingdom to us? Yep. Lord, when, when are you, when, you know, are you going to at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And it's like, it's like, I don't know. We seem to be missing the point. Yeah. We seem to be misunderstanding what the resurrected Jesus means to us presently. Mm -hmm. You know, even in this already and not yet moment, you know, we're asking about our kingdom and we're not coming to grips with Jesus's kingdom too well. Right. And it's causing all sorts of division. Of course, you know, Luke, you know, Luke in, in his gospel, you know, he tells the story of this, that apostle's thought fleshed out. And they're, they're asking questions like, who's going to be the greatest? And they're having these debates of like, in, in this kingdom that God's going to restore to us, man, I'm going to sit on his right hand. And they're like, no, nah, man, you're going to be on this left hand. I'm going to be on his right hand. Right. And like, you're not even going to be sitting around him. You're just going to be in the, in the normal crowd. Mm-hmm. And I can just imagine Jesus's frustration of like, my, guys, my kingdom is here. It's right now. I've commissioned you. I've called you. I've even given you my spirit. You have everything you need to to reach the ends of the earth. And uh, and you guys are too busy about about your own kingdom. And yeah. I don't know. I, I I feel that. I feel in my own heart. I mean, I'm asking Jesus. Jesus, when are you going to restore my kingdom to me? You yeah. know. Yeah. And it's a it's it's a struggle, man. It's a struggle. But Jesus is so patient. He's so, so patient. And even the promise that he makes to them, he's like, listen, uh, you might misunderstand my kingdom, but you will be my witnesses and you will have power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. I'm going to make you my witnesses. Um, what, you know, what you've seen, you can't unsee and it's going to be transformative. I, um, I appreciate you bringing up the, the, the acts, right? Because I, when Pentecost this year happened, I, I did a podcast with a, with a buddy of mine and yeah. I made the comment that I thought that the Pentecost, the celebration of Pentecost this year was the most in tune of any Pentecost since the Bible account, because suddenly every church was forced to either get on Zoom or Facebook or YouTube or yada, yada, yada. And so we had more um, extension of the gospel by more means in any other way, I'd say in human history, looking at how yeah. to use the internet, right? That's right which is totally a rework in Pentecost. And uh, my buddy Drew, he laughed and he goes, I think it's like Pentecost because Pentecost, exactly what you're, you're saying, or in some ways what you're saying, suddenly forced all the disciples and apostles, all those who are gathered, to work in new ways to figure out how to carry that gospel. And he goes, in the congregations, he was sitting in, and he goes, suddenly my ushers are my sound guys. Suddenly the altar guild is doing this other thing, yada, yada, yada. And everybody's roles have been shifted and changed. And we know that even though our roles have been changed, our task is the same, which is carrying the gospel. And, you know, it's one of those in a very Lutheran way where you're like, yeah, it's kind of a both and answer because both of these things are happening. Um, yeah. It, it was funny because when, when, uh, when I wrote that question and I, I was getting ready to ask you, in my mind, I, um, I was originally batting back and forth between either the Exodus account or the, um, 
the Assyrian conquest. Mm. And I decided uh, the Assyrian conquest, because, uh, you know, they come in and take over and the uh, northern kingdom gets pushed out. Because I, I'm always reminded every time I read Exodus that no one who left Egypt actually ended up in the promised land. Like, there's a, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I don't think that's going to be the case here. But when, when you think about the captivity, uh, you know, we have so many congregations, especially congregations that have been, like, established, who we, we know what the hurdle is. Um, and there's something that's keeping us from coming back home into the, the physical structures, into the potlucks in that community. Um, but as you very, uh, very articulately said, uh, this is kind of like focusing on our kingdom a little bit more than being outward focused, right? Um, if the goal of any church is merely to be back in the physical space, then they are kind of missing the point. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, one of the things I was really happy about was um, – it was back in August. I realized that, again, I had this group of people, wonderful congregation, uh, really tied into the physicality of that building, and they missed that Sunday morning ritual of you wake up, you get dressed, you drive to the building, yada, yada, yada. So trying to just figure out how to use that in a positive way. In August and then in um, October and September, we uh, used the parking lot for a drive-by um, donation drive for the Lutheran Social Services Food Pantry. Mm, yeah. So it gave everybody that opportunity to wake up on a Sunday morning, to get in a car, to drive, to drop something off, and, you know, to, to scratch that itch in a really positive way. And also remind us that our, our ministry always, <laughs> worship happens in the sanctuary, ministry happens outside the parking lot. You, you know what I mean? Like, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. I, I think so much, and I think church planning has helped us with this, and certainly COVID has helped, helped us with this thought that, you know, this, this kingdom and, and, and the ministry that we have, even, even the idea of the church itself is so universal. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it blows, it, it blows the four walls of our churches away in the sense of like, that's, 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 it's helpful. It's great, but it, it's not primary. In other words, the thief on the cross, right? The thief on the cross came, ha, had a come to Jesus moment mm -hmm. at that, at that moment, you know, he did nothing wrong but remember me. And Jesus said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. So you can see like the mission of God was even carried out on a, on a bloody execution cross. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if that's our, if that's our mission and, and God, God used a moment like that, then it helps highlight the fact that it, it really, the, the kingdom mission needs to be able to be done anywhere, a anywhere and at all times. And so, yeah, it helps us, helps us put aside um, it, it helps us put aside, it, it can be, it can be in jail in, in China, right? Where many of our brothers and sisters are for yeah. the name of Christ. Like if, if the spirit of God can't move there and if the ministry of God can't go forward there, then, then what are we doing? It, it's a, it's a hopeless cause. So, you know, in one sense, we need to kind of get down to the most common denominator of, you know, how, how can we ensure that, uh, that we are doing what God has called us to do today, missionally speaking, um, and how can we believe the truth that, you know, even when we, if we go to, to the depths of the abyss, even there, your right hand will lead me and guide me, Psalm 139 says. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I love the four walls of the church. You know, yeah. our, our four walls are very beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure yours are too. And on all the things surrounding and kind of the accoutrements of, of the worship scenario are wonderful. Um, but none of those things make up the substance of who Christ is you know, in, in, in totality. So in, in sense, we, we have the spirit of God within us. You know, we, we are the temple of Christ. Christ is with us. And so wherever we go, we can be assured uh, that he is with us and that we can worship in him and with him. So yeah, it's really encouraging, even for us as a church plan, as things aren't established, you know, we can meet in a, in a community group home on a Wednesday night. Yep. It's, you know, and God, God is still with us. No, well, um, Luther's, uh, Luther's, Consent Latin word for that would be adiaphora. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, things that are not quintessential for salvation. Mm. Uh, and I, I always think there's a story that uh, back in the um, early 20th century uh, in Minneapolis, there was a street corner with four Lutheran churches. And the, the, the first one moved in, and it was the German Lutheran church. And then a bunch of Swedes came to town, and they're like, well, you don't do what we do. So they built a church across the street, and that was first Swedish. 
And then the, uh, the German church renovated and half the congregation wanted purple carpet and half wanted red. There's a schism, so they built across from, you know, they were second German Lutheran church. And then the, uh, the Swedish church painted the front door and half of them wanted it red and half of them wanted it black. And then they schismed. And so there's this four corner, there's this intersection with four Lutheran churches that are all related because again, we'd much rather argue about the accoutrements <laughs> than actually, uh, uh, and I think, I mean, that's, you know, the, the, the weakness of the flesh, right? We get into those ruts and we want what we want. And, um, yeah, we, uh, we put the cart in front of the horse way too often and sadly in so many different ways, you know? That's right. That's mm. right. Yeah, it's so true. And a lot of times the church is at the forefront of doing that, you know, the church and the church leadership, you know, we're, we're at the forefront of, of promoting that and doing that selfishly, you know, that's true. Yeah. So shifting our, shifting our, our uh, conversation from the state of the church in the world right now, if we take the, the same question, what biblical account do you think best reflects the state of, what do, what do we say the world in general? The world at large. What biblical account reflects the world at large? Man. That is, oh man, that is such a, that is such a good thought. Um, you, you know, I think, man, the, the, the amount of self, the kind of self-righteousness and self-promotion that our world faces um, and, and even self-protection um, I, I'm tempted to think of even like, like Samaritan woman sort of situation mm-hmm. um, where, you know, where Jesus comes to us and, and we try to have all the right answers, you know, like, you know, what are you doing? Why, you know, why are you here? Why are you asking me for water? Yep. And, uh, and, and Jesus is like, I think if you were really understanding who I was, you know, you'd, you'd be asking me to give you, give you the water. And she's yes. like, but buddy, you don't even have a well. Like, like it's all these logical answers. Like you, you, like this well is deep. You don't even have a bucket. How are you going to, how are you going to do that? You know? And then Jesus is like, well, I'm, I'm here to give you, give, give you living water. And, uh, and she's like, well, I want some of that. You know, what, what will it cost me? How, how do I get that? And he, and he's like, you know what? Go call your husband. And she's like, well, I don't, I don't have a husband. And Jesus is like, well, of course you don't, because the husband you have now is actually not your husband. He's your boyfriend. And you've had five other husbands. And then she tries to double down and like defend herself by, by talking religiously. And so you have all these, like, you can see her, her plight, right? Mm -hmm. She's trying to, to muster up all sorts of self-justifying logic, um, even like religiosity. She's claiming that, you know, my, our father said that, you know, we would worship here. And I know that when the Messiah comes, he'll tell us all these things and he'll clear up all these things that are, that are rooted in our past. So I, I, I see all these kind of like um, self-justifying moments. They're like, we're good. We're good. We're fine. We're fine. I'm all right. I'm all right. And Jesus is kindly trying to help us to see that like, you're a mess and it's okay. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm here. I'm here to give you living water. Uh, I know everything about you and it's okay. And my salvation is for you world, the entire world. So, so go tell your people and come. And then he tells the, the disciples, like he tells us, look, look and see, like at this moment, at this time, the fields are white unto harvest. See, see these Samaritans coming in and running to me. Yeah. Let's, let's go reach them. And I, I see the world like that. I see, I see this, this convergence of people trying to self justify and using all streams of logic and religiosity to try to make themselves present to God. And it's like, like, no, God, God knows every one of our struggles. He is here for us. But then he looks at the church and he says, the field is white unto harvest. See these people that I've brought through, through hell and back and showed them and exposed them. And they're here, they're here to hear the name of Christ. Go tell them, you mm-hmm. know? And, uh, so I, I don't know, I mean, I, I see our world like right there in that moment. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that the, that we can actually taste and see the living water, not the broken cisterns of, of this world currently. Yeah. No, well said. Well said. Huh. I am. Um, I, I, I was wrestling with this question a lot the last couple of days to, to figure it out. And um, I really think, and this is probably going to sound awkward, especially coming from the Lutheran in this conversation. Sure. Um, but uh, I would say the um, Revelation, like the book of Revelation. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I say Revelation as 
one who understands and believes that Revelation is a book of gospel salvation. Yes. You know, because quintessential, uh, you know, it, so talk about missing the point, right? If we, if we get caught up in the, uh, the symbolism and the imagery and, uh, and we don't have that great back catalog of Old Testament stories that John is pulling from, then, you know, it's easy to get lost in Revelation, like Greek mythology or D&D or stuff like that. That's right. That's right. But for me, the, the point of Revelation is always the fact that uh, John uh, is walking through and sees all these things happening and mm -hmm. doesn't worry at all because he realizes that his life and his soul is invested not in this world. Yes. So in the midst of that, it's a book about the strength we can find in faith and the comfort and the protection we have following Christ, yes. despite the fact that the world looks like it's on fire. And with all the things that have happened in America since January 1st, it's really easy to look around and be like, man, everything's on fire. Um, and so it's, I, I think there's a lot of people in the world who are looking at Christian communities and communities of faith going, how are you so calm? Because if you don't have that foundation of belief, like where do you find comfort in between everything that's going on, not only in America, but around the world right now. That's right. That's I, uh, it, it's funny, we were, we were talking about Psalm 23 earlier. I, um, I had the uh, revelation the other day that verse four of the 23rd Psalm, uh, though I walk through the shadow of the, the valley of death, you are with me. Hmm. That one verse encompasses the entire gospel statement of the book of Revelation. Huh. Right? We, we are led and we are walking through the valley of the shadow of the evil and we have nothing to fear because we are with the shepherd, right? Like that is the gospel of revelation. And I, I look at the world right now and I, I go, yeah, that, that's what I feel called to go out and like share with people. Like you said, right. like people are hungry for that good news. I, I had a mentor once say, uh, when you're writing a sermon, you don't have to preach too long to get everybody on the page that the world is not perfect. Yes, that's right. What they're looking for is in the face of this not perfect world, what do I do now? Yes. And that's when we turn them to Christ. That's true. That's right. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting times. Um, final question as, as, we, uh, as we wrap up. Um, you guys are doing your uh, uh, church launch on October 25th. We'll put the uh, time and address of that in the description below. Um, you guys are at, at where you are. You're not too far from Whitehall. You're, you're in the neighborhood. Huh. That's right. Yeah, so I think that uh, especially as things start to normalize, we should figure out something that we can do together, some, some kind of partnering. Just because I, I, we are Christian communities, and that is the foundation that we need to share, but we also look really different. So there could be a really fun experience there. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, I we are right down the street, and I think in 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 one sense, um, our our communities do share a lot in common, and we can work together for the sake of the kingdom towards bettering our community and and, and helping our community, loving our community. So yeah, any sort of um, any sort of active participation. Uh, in the community that either you're doing or, or we're doing, I definitely see a future partnership uh, with with you all and and helping us come. Again, we don't have a lot of resources, um, so we're kind of coming as as baby asking a lot of mamas like, hey, you know, can can we share in that? Can we can we have that? Can we partner along with you on that? And that's how a lot of uh, you know a lot of church plants like ours kind of just find our footing and find our ground. Um, but and I don't mean this uh, I, I don't mean this as a throwaway comment because these are things that we're seeing as a small church, much like the beginning church in, in the book of Acts. But um, we really, we really could use prayer. Mm -hmm. We really could, could, could benefit and partner together uh, with praying, not just for our own two communities, certainly by our church communities, we, we could use prayer personally. Um, but there are, there are people in our community that we know Jesus has intended for us to reach. Um, we don't know their names yet. We haven't seen their faces. Um, but we believe that God has called us here to reach people uh, in this community with the gospel. And so we, we could use prayer for them. That's, that's really like we can, we can, and that's, I think it's actually like a partnering together. God answers the prayer of his people uh, in Christ for the sake of souls. It, if, if all the souls were collected, we wouldn't be here. We'd be wrapped up. 
And so we feel like this is, a, this is actually according to God's will, that he would want us to pray for the souls around us that he ten, intends for us to reach. Right. Uh, that we can actually partner together as, as church communities. I know there are people in Whitehall that you feel the same way about. Uh, even as you're, you're handing them uh, food or clothing, uh, you're, you're also wanting to hand them the gospel and say, listen, you know, th- this, is, this is temporary comfort. This is temporary. It'll, it'll pass through your belly. But the reality is, you know, there's something that's eternal. We want you to know that as well. And so, you know, we, we could spend time praying for your community as well. And, and we know that God does answer these prayers. So, so let's partner together in that way for the sake of our community, for the salvation of souls. Uh, but also just for, for you know, we, we aren't going to be able to reach everybody. But we do want them in this world to to know the love of Jesus in some way. Maybe we're planting seeds of, of Christ's love right within them. So there are things that we can partner together hands-on as well for communities. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, are you aware, and probably, I, I don't want to blow too much of, of your cover coming from that kind of Baptist background, but uh, I, I work a, a lot with community partners in Whitehall. And so every month we do a, a free community meal at our church where we get a kickback from Two Tones Brewing right there in Whitehall. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. That- they, they, uh, they told me about that because they, I, you know, I was introducing myself to them and they're like, what do you do? And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm a pastor. We're starting a church. And he's like, Hey, well, we have, we have another pastor that comes in here. You know, they, they pointed me your way. And so actually that's how I, that's how I got word of what you guys are doing. I think it's wonderful. Yeah. I know that in, in some, uh, in some uh, sects of Christendom, thankfully Lutheranism is not one of them. You know, you, you can't have too many conversations about your pastor hanging out at the bar. I appreciate that uh, we, we do not find ourselves in that uh, uh, reality. Um, but yeah, no, because uh, I've only been back in town for 18 months, right? And so just by the fact that the congregation has been there, um, a lot of my first year work is like a lot of your first year work. It's who are our community partners? Who can we engage with? How can we do that sort of thing? And so being able to work with uh, food trucks in Whitehall, uh, breweries, other businesses in Whitehall, um, because yeah, the, the idea is how do we serve that community that we're in? And I, I, I would love to be able to put something together with, you know, the people of faith and the people of good shepherd and, and just figure out how we can kind of uh, uh, yoke ourselves together in, in the task that we are called to, which is, the exact same, despite the fact that the communities may look different on the outside. That's right. That's right. And I, and I would ask this of, of your folks, you folks have, have the history and tradition and and we are new to the ground. A lot of our folks are actually uh, from Columbus, but they're, they're moving out East with us uh, to be able to reach this community, uh, which is, which is really cool to see, by the way, it's kind of a, Mm -hmm. these folks are taking them themselves as missionaries to the, to the Eastern part of Columbus, which is great, but we're new. And uh, if there's any, um, if there's anything that we should know about any, any sort of uh, even people with influence, people, people in the governmental uh, sector that, that we should know about, uh, because the gospel does go forward better with influence. It just does. The more influence you have, the more the gospel can go forward. Uh, So if if there's anything that we should be aware of, know, connect with, please, uh, if you have those connections, uh, we would we would love to share in that with you. We would love to partner with you in that uh, or just be aware of it, make those connections. So so feel, feel free to shoot me a text, shoot me an email and say, hey, you're in that area. You need to know this person or, you know, I have family in that area. We'll knock on doors. We'll do whatever we need to do uh, to make sure that people can believe in hope in Jesus. Nice, nice. Well, my friend, uh, Hunter, thank you so much for your time this morning. Blessings to you family and this ministry that you're doing there with a uh, good shepherd. I appreciate you and uh, um, wish you all the best in everything that you are undertaking, my friend. Yeah, that's awesome. Dan, thank you so much for, for having me on the episode. Uh, people of faith, uh, we're already praying for you. Uh, we're already for you. Uh, looking forward to seeing what God, what God does in your community. And, and I guess as they would say in Lutheran circles and Christ be also with you. Is that, is that right? Is that it? That's it. And also, did, with- did I do it right? And also with you. That's right. Same. Blessings on you. Bye.